if you've got a if you've got a phone a smartphone you are a, a bona fide journalist i don't think it's it's nowhere near the point where we need black lives matter they want to make the decision for you i could make 15 bucks a week delivering newspapers hi i'm greg Mustreader, and this is my podcast on rationality transhumanism and trends of development in society today here with me is robert bridge a journalist from the U.S. currently based in Moscow, Russia. Hi, Robert. Hello, Greg. Nice to have me. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, the topic that uh, interests me a lot and that I would like to discuss with you is the media and where uh, this is all going. Uh, don't you think that the role of the media has been shifting over the last several years dramatically? Uh, yeah, I think that would be putting it mildly. Um, <laughs> I remember when my, my, uh, my career started in journalism, I was a paper boy. <laughs> this was going back like, uh, I don't want to give away my age too much, but it was going back a long time. This was like a, a career, I guess you could call it a career in the United States where kids could have a paper route, mm -hmm. okay? And you'd walk around the neighborhood and you'd deliver newspapers, Okay, yeah. so this was kind of like the way that the people in my street, 65 customers that I had on Bondview Street, this is how they like they were waiting at the door for me to have to deliver hand deliver them a newspaper. Okay, I mean, this profession now, if you can call it a profession, that's probably saying too much, but it was a nice way for a kid, you know, to, you know, I was 12 years old at the time, I could make 15 bucks a week delivering newspapers. And this was like the cutting edge of the news industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ted mm -hmm. Turner, CNN had not been introduced yet. There's no idea mm -hmm. of this 24 hour news service. Social media was basically meeting with your friends at the pizza shop <laughs> and playing pinball or asteroids or something like that. So <clears throat> this whole idea, this whole notion of the media now, it's uh, to say where it's going, Greg, that's a really, <laughs> that's a very tough question because it's just, you've got now, uh, not only do you have the, the five, for example, the five big media companies that are controlling mm -hmm. the media in the United States. You've got, okay, government-run media. You've got uh, individual independent journalists. Because this is the beauty of social media, is that anybody can be a journalist. If you've got a, if you've got a phone, a smartphone, you are a, a bona fide journalist. You can go out into the street. You can conduct interviews. You can videotape people. You can get, get better news if you're if you happen to be at the right spot at the right time or have the right connections you can get better information than cnn for example or sure. fox news whoever so to say where it's going that's that's a very um the sky is really the limit and uh so yeah i mean just that's i'm sorry to not be able to be very specific but it's just uh it's it's hard to say really with everything there's just so much technology now that Anybody can be a player in this in the media field, really. You mentioned social media. Would you say that Facebook, Twitter are also like competing with media companies and overtaking them? Uh, I'd have to say that they're working kind of hand in hand with them. Unfortunately, um, the tendency right now in the United States is that everything is. And for me, this is very frustrating because I, I don't. I used to be very liberal in my views, but over the years I've become much more conservative. So I see that the tendency now in the United States is, it's not even a tendency, it's a fact that it's 99% controlled by the liberal left. Okay, so you've got Twitter, Facebook, all these Silicon Valley companies, they're the run out of California, and California is like the hotbed of, of leftist ideology. Yeah. Uh, liberalism and although I'm, I'm not going to slam liberalism i understand that there are people who might agree with the ideology but if you're if you're trying to get a different word in edgewise against these types of companies these liberal companies media companies it's extremely difficult and right now for example just today i picked i turned on my computer went on to the judge drudge report mm -hmm. and the first story that i saw was that Zero Hedge, which is one of the few uh, right-leaning media uh, like publications, it's they, they handle a lot of so-called conspiracy theorist alt-right news, which is what they, they label it as. But they were demonetized by Google, okay? Um, 
as well as the fed the federalists well they think the federalists might be there's they gave them a warning they i guess if they mm-hmm. if they change their ways in two weeks or so something like that they'll they'll let them get get some money from the advertising from google so to me that's uh that's extremely disturbing to see that that there are a handful of of companies twitter facebook youtube uh there are so many different youtube channels that i used to follow and because of their right right wing uh slant they were either outright banned mm-hmm. or demonetized to the point where the people just couldn't they couldn't afford to do it because of course this takes this takes time putting together as you know putting together a program takes a lot of work you have to prepare for it and if you're spending hours a day doing it and then all of a sudden they youtube tells you oh sorry we don't like your we don't like what you're putting out your fake news um there's your livelihood down the drain and and not only that i mean years of work i've seen i've seen youtube creators they've they've lost all of their work they have the ability to do that they can just you know flush everything that you've done over the course of a lifetime right down the memory hole and to me that's extremely disturbing yeah although i i wouldn't agree with the most of those uh alt-right uh, creators who have been either banned or demonetized by youtube i'm also terrified by all that because mm-hmm. uh, and and many many youtubers and bloggers are because their livelihood depends on it and uh this platform may take some controversial actions uh, to to promote their policies but on the other hand you're saying that there is a uh, uh, left domination uh, mm-hmm. in the social media but on the other hand uh, there are lots of stories about how the alt-right movement is rising uh, there have been uh, those trends uh, for several years now i guess and uh, Uh, you might have uh, read the uh, New York Times articles on how uh, YouTube radicalizes uh, the youth. These famous uh, long reads that uh, detail how how this uh, how this works when you uh, get in when you get into this rabbit hole of uh, first of all slightly mildly right wing videos, then more something controversial, some uh, conspiracy theories, and Who's stuff to like say- this. Who's to say, though, first of all, what is a conspiracy theory? I think that that's the most dangerous and meaningless term that they've ever come up with. And it's very effective. Nobody wants to be labeled, a, you know, tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy mm-hmm. theorists. It's it's a terrible thing. Obviously. Yeah. Um, and what that does is, is that it takes away people's ability to make decisions for themselves. If I tell you that you shouldn't watch this, Greg, because you might fall down that rabbit hole. <laughs> um, is that giving you the ability, the freedom of thought? I mean, pe- every individual has the ability to make individual decisions by themselves. And I, I'm an intelligent person, and I feel that I can weigh the information that I'm being presented with here and here and here. And me, as a rational thinking person... I'm able to make my decisions. And the thing is, they don't want people to be confronted with the ability to make their own decisions. They want to make the decision for you. And that's that's not right. You should be, They should be able to trust people, and people should be trusted. Um, and if people want to believe, for example, that, I don't know, um, COVID, this whole COVID thing is fake, okay? Or um, 911 was an inside job. Okay, I mean, people... People may look at that and they might say, okay, this is really radical stuff. But on the other hand, that's what, a, that's what the First Amendment of the, United, of the U.S. Mm-hmm. Constitution, first of all, gives us, is the, is the ability to say whatever we want so long as it doesn't inflict harm on other people. I'm not, I'm not calling for violence. Nobody's calling for violence. Nobody's calling for harm against another person. Okay? We're just talking about ideas, but they don't want those ideas to even be discussed. Okay, so that's I think that is that's very problematic. Um, yeah, the alt right is definitely rising, but um, it's also there's this there's, that's really what's happening now is like there's really a war going on because the alt right feels and I know this personally they feel so frustrated that they don't really have an outlet to present their views and the, the few one the few outlets that are left Fox News um, you know you have Zero Hedge. Mm-hmm a bunch of small publications, the Federalist, the New Conservative, those types of publications. They're very um, below the radar. 
uh, they don't they don't hit a mainstream. You have to be really looking for this type of news in order to find it. It's not going to be thrown at you by Drudge, the Drudge Report, for example, the the big aggregate of of news. Uh, but I think uh, Ben Shapiro's podcast is uh, in in one of the top podcasts. Although he is not, uh, he does not uh, identify himself as alt right, but I think he's close to yeah, those that, views. That that is yeah. There are and there are some people that are are so popular that it would be really difficult to touch them. Ben Shapiro is one of them. But for example, I knew I, there was another guy, Owen Benjamin. He was he had he had a show. He was more conspiratorial conspiratorial um didn't they people just didn't like his views so he he was he's cut from and there i mean you could name dozens of others but there are people like ben shapiro who have managed to continue and paul paul uh paul watson for example he's another one um mark dice you have you have uh there there are definitely yeah i'm not going to deny it that and some of these guys they get on women for example candace owens a black woman She's got millions of over a million uh, followers. She's pushing for the she's pushing for people to leave the Democratic Party, and she's really brilliant, brilliant woman, Candace Owens. Uh, so yeah, there there are definitely people who. But this is the thing they they always have the power. If these people go a little bit too far, if they say something wrong, like James Woods, for example, the actor, he's very conservative. He's been he's been cut from from Twitter. So I mean, you could. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you could name dozens who have been who have been axed, and so is that correct? I, I mean, they're, they're private corporations; they can they can they are in much, the right yeah. to do so. Yeah, First yeah. Amendment does not uh, apply here. Right. So, where where do people have the freedom of speech though? If they if they can't get their freedom of speech through corporations, which now control all of the mm -hmm. our voices. If we can't get our voices heard over the over the media, the corporate media, corporate owned media. Then what are our options? We could, you know, maybe try to start our own a YouTube channel. We could try to start our own little publication, but let's face it; those those are very difficult things to do. And that's that's why myself personally, I I really appreciate the fact that I am working in Russia because, although people may have their arguments also about, you know, how the media is here. I mean, like everywhere, I think everybody everybody has a complaint about their own media. Um, it does. It has given me the ability to write um, in a way that I don't feel I would be able to write in the United States. I don't think my I would have such an audience. I wouldn't have such so. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, if you write about Russia, you are not as free in Russia as you are in the U.S. I remember this uh, anecdote uh, when uh, some American said that uh, uh, we in the U.S. we live in a free country so we can criticize our president uh, on uh, on a public square uh, in front of uh, lots of people and nothing will happen to us and uh, some soviet guy says yeah we live in a free country as well we can criticize your president in front of <laughs> lots of people on a public square as well so uh, this this story comes to mind but okay never mind mm -hmm. so uh, of course uh, uh, an outside view from Russia. That's that's what what you have. Uh, uh, an outside view um, to look at things uh, in the U.S. from a different perspective. It's it's something really valuable, I think. So uh, absolutely. And you mentioned uh, the fact that uh, corporations uh, now control everything, and uh, uh, you can't express uh, freely on those platform. Uh, well, um, the new Trump measures certainly come to mind here. Do you approve of his plan to to take down the the powers of social uh, media? I, I mean, those executive order was it uh, to mm -hmm. to. Uh, aimed at the Twitter and Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see where he's going with it, and I I would have to see exactly what the, the final idea would be. But he, as president of the United States, he put out a tweet, okay, and he said something about mail-in... Mail, the, the two, there were two tweets in a row. I can't, I can't really remember the second one. But the one was when about the looting, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. That okay, was the, that the one. First they, one. They said that was that was uh, violent, a violent a tweet of a violent nature. The other one was about mail-in ballots, mm -hmm. and they had attached, and this is very controversial. And this is another thing: who who are 
the guardians of the social media? This is another big question. Yeah. The, a lot of these people and organizations who are serving as the gatekeepers for what's permitted on the social media, they are left, left-wing left organizations as well. Mm-hmm. If you look into this, um, individuals as well as organizations like the Atlantic Council, for example, uh, these, these are the groups who are, which other ones, SPLC, ADL, very left-leaning and... So Trump put out this tweet about that mail-in ballots are prone to corruption. Okay, and it's it's actually it's been proven many times that mm-hmm. for people to mail in their ballot, there there's a, a very high possibility that somebody's going to get that mail. They're going to do something to it, or they're going to somebody's going to steal mail from people who aren't living in the houses. They're going to fill in the ballot for them. There, it, it's it's been proven that it's very it's very easy to manipulate the mail-in ballots. So this was a very legitimate point that he had made. Okay. The, right now, I mean, you have to understand too what's happening. This is, this is the year 2020. We've got one of the most consequential presidential elections coming up. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is going to be huge, really. It's, it's just, and that, I, I personally believe that that's why we see so much violence in the United States right now is because of the, because of the elections. Um, and regardless, I think, of who wins, I think you're going to see a lot of problems on the streets of America, unfortunately. But that's that's another question. Um, so yeah, t- uh, Trump was very upset because they attached a note to his his Twitter that said um, they like said no, it's not really easy to manipulate mail-in ballots. So they were trying to correct him, the president of the United States. So this to me, this is an example of okay, if the president of the United States has trouble putting across his message without it being in some way played with or tampered with or monkeyed with by the powers that be, what are the chances for other people? Okay. I mean, they would love to delete the guy completely. They would love it. And they, I mean, that would be their, (laughs) but of of course that would start another war. But, um, so yeah, I, I agree with him. And there are lots of people on the right that they, and I don't necessarily agree with government intervention to solve problems. It's better to, to have different avenues to work things out. But without any other thing happening, if it has to come down to the president of the United States, be it Trump or whoever, saying, okay, guys, you know, you guys are too big. You have too much power. We're going to have to break you guys up into smaller people, like they did with, with Bell Telephone many years ago. Yeah. Okay? If a, if a company becomes so big that it becomes so powerful that it's affecting the freedoms and liberties of, of, other, of the, the citizens, then there comes a point when we have to say, okay, we need to do something. We need to break them up. You know, or do whatever. Uh, give maybe, maybe make laws. Maybe make laws. Um, so, well, there have been uh, there have been talks about splitting Facebook up for quite a long time now. Maybe, maybe something like that will happen, or maybe the services provided by uh, those type of companies will be deemed as uh, public services, mm-hmm. something like public utilities. It's also a possible approach. Sure. But yeah, uh, they definitely, uh, the the government will definitely try to do something. Although I, I'm not sure if 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 they succeed, because uh, you don't know who's more powerful now. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, Silicon Valley wields a lot of power, and, and this is another problem with American politics: is that okay, so. What's going to happen is Trump. Trump's in now. He's reversing a lot of the things that the liberals did under Barack Obama, and with the next election, with the next cycle, and you, you know you're going to get a liberal president in there. Maybe they're just gonna, they're going to reverse things. So it's like a tennis match back and forth. It's very frustrating, actually. You just want to see some stability and some laws put down that everybody can agree with. But that's the problem with the United States that you're never going to get to that point when you can please everybody. So. And uh, nowadays, it's uh, especially acute, I think, uh, the polarization. Everybody's talking about how polarized uh, the, the states have become. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I'm looking at it from here, and I just, it's hard for me to understand. As an American, it's, it's really, I mean, I, I always knew that we had that tendency to, for things to go a little bit off the rails. Um, and here's here's I think where the media is really, really manipulating the situation. I don't. I personally, 
you know, I, I worked before I came to Russia, I worked in a phone company, okay, for a few years. And I worked with, it was a very diverse, let me just giving you my personal story. Yeah. It was a very diverse workplace, you know, black people, white people all working together. No problems at all. And I think throughout the United States, this is, this is really the reality that in, in general, white people and black people get along fine. I have, I have black friends, we, you know, there's, speaking about my own personal experience again, but, you know, you talk to people and this whole thing about racism, it's, uh, it's really, I, I honestly believe that if people threw away their TVs, this racism problem would disappear. Of course, there are pockets of, of racism. You have people in certain parts of the country who, who do have these racist views. But blacks and whites have been living together now for decades. And all of a sudden, you have a cop, a white cop, in an election year, okay, very significant election year, is videotaped killing a black man on video. Horrendous. No doubt about it. It's, it's the worst thing to see, okay? Um, is that really, can that really be, con and then a few days later, a, a, a black guy was shot in a Wendy's parking lot because he was asleep in his car. Okay, but the guy had a, had a long, this doesn't necessarily justify his killing, but the guy had a long list of offenses before that. He attacked the police officers who were trying to arrest him. He grabbed their taser. Mm -hmm. He tried to shoot the cops with the taser, which could have led to them being killed if they were disabled by the taser. He could have taken their guns and shot yeah. them. Okay, so they killed the guy. You don't see any of that lead up to that point when this black guy was shot in the back. Okay, you don't see that in the CNN and MSNBC. They don't show that point. They show the point when the cop, when the cop is shooting the guy. Okay, so now you have this uh, Chevron, this cop, this white cop kills George Floyd. Um, so is this a, is this a problem with racism? And that's what that's what of course you, it's being portrayed as. This is racism. This is a racist cop killing a defenseless black guy. Okay. But is it really? Or could you look at the fact that we need police reform, that police don't understand how to arrest people, that their, their procedures are completely, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, Be, they've become militarized in some cases, okay? That's personally my opinion. I think that's really mm -hmm. at heart the issue here. It's not about racism per se, although there are certainly cops in the United States who you could say are probably racist, blacks and whites, there are blacks who hate white people. There are whites who hate black people. It's it's never going to change. Is this a systemic problem in the United States? Personally, I would have to say no. I don't think it's it's nowhere near the point where we need Black Lives Matter protests and we don't need people burning down city centers. And I think this is just, and I think the media in the United States, they have to take a huge, huge amount of responsibility for that, what's happening. But uh, would you argue with uh, uh, the statistics that show that uh, blacks get much worse treatment uh, by the police, for example, in similar situations? Uh, more of them, uh, percentage-wise, gets uh, like killed while uh, arrested and armed, uh, like George Floyd uh, and uh, those other people. So there is probably some racism in that regard, isn't it? Um, actually, no. Um, first of all, more white people are killed by cops, although you have to understand I said that there percentage are more, wise, yeah, percentage yeah. wise. Yes, definitely. There are more, more blacks killed. Um, but there are whites who are also killed percentage wise. There are more blacks, but then you have to ask the question who, who is having more interaction with the police, the black people or the white people. And because the black people, this is just statistically proven they're committing more crimes. Um, black people, okay, kill more black people than, okay, if you want to, if you want to look at the statistics, mm -hmm. who's killing the black people in their communities, 90% of it, I don't, I don't know the exact statistics, don't quote me, but it's very high. Yeah. Blacks are killing blacks at a, an unbelievable rate. Okay, so of course, you're going to have more cases and incidences of white cops, black cops, Spanish cops, interacting with these these people who are charged criminals i mean until they've been proven guilty criminals but those uh, statistics uh, that say that black people kill other black people uh, more often than than whites do 
it's also a reflection of the history of racism in the U.S., of discrimination, of the fact that still uh, racial minorities are underprivileged and commit more crimes because of hardships, stuff like that. Uh, you could you could look at it that way, but you could also we first of all we've done a lot of things in the United States to lift the minorities out of their positions, okay, of of impoverishment, for example. Um, there's been so the civil rights movement. There's been um, uh, what's it called? Affirmative action. Affirmative action. Okay. Uh, yeah, but probably welfare. it does not go away uh, like in an instant. It's uh, no, it's in it's, it's a long story. Uh, so now they now the black Black Lives Matters. They're calling for reparations for the slave yeah. for the I mean, to the tune of I think sixteen trillion dollars, which I think will bankrupt the United States if they if they actually succeed. So. Uh, yeah, I see what you, I, I see your point, Greg, and I think a lot of people could make that that argument. And it's a very unfortunate stain on the United States that we did have slavery, <clears throat> and um, how much that held back black people, I don't know. And can you put a price tag on that position? I don't know. And have we done enough to help them? I don't know either. Uh, but I can say one thing though: I don't I don't think that the racism actually exists to the degree mm -hmm. that it's being portrayed as in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from uh, racism and issues surrounding it, surrounding it, uh, there are lots of other issues uh, that uh, cause polarization in the states. Uh, do you agree? Other issues that cause polarization? Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. There's. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, economic polarization, you, that's the amazing thing about the United States. And it's, it's kind of funny to me that, when, like, for example, when I'm in a taxi here in, in Moscow and I tell somebody that I'm from the United States, oh, why are you here? Why aren't you back in the United States? You know, where the <laughs> streets are paved of gold and it rains mm -hmm. silver, or, you know. So, like, when you walk down through New York City, I don't mean, I don't want to bash the country too much. It's a great country, but we do have severe pockets of, of poverty to the point that I don't even think that anybody would even believe it. In my hometown of Pittsburgh, there are cities, I mean, parts of the city that you just do not walk through. At least there were. I don't know how mm -hmm. it's changed now, but you don't even want to drive through these, these parts of the city. But there are other parts, too, that are just absolutely amazing. So, you know, you do have this, you have this huge difference between, and it's, it's dangerous, actually, right now, especially with, with what's happening and that's why they have to be really careful how they portray this, because there are people who and now you have the COVID, the COVID-19, millions of people out of work. Um, now they've, now they're being hit with this George Floyd killing. They're pent up. They've been in the house. They don't have money. Let's go out and burn something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's it's a very dangerous situation right now in the United States. And yeah, there, there are many Many examples of polarization, definitely um, educational. Uh, you have uh, public schools. There are public schools where you would not want to send your kids. I have children here. I have no problem sending my children to a, a Russian public school. Yeah. I, feel, I know that they're at least, although I, when I tell Russians this now, they say, oh, you should have seen it back in the Soviet. It was much, much better. <laughs> but I know one thing that my children, they come home from school with literally bags of bricks on their back that I mean books that weigh the, the amount of bricks mm -hmm. yeah so they're they're really studying hard and I and of course in the United States we do have great public schools but we do have a lot of urban inner city schools that are horrible teachers don't want to teach there kids don't listen it's they're just horrible you know really bad places and then, you know and then on the other side you have fantastic private schools so it's the best of both the best and worst of both worlds I guess you could say do you think you can fix that polarization? I mean, uh, not you personally, but uh, in general. Do you think the U.S. will fix it? Um, yeah, I th and of, of unfortunately, I think it's instead of dumping, you know, trillion dollars annually into the military, for example, and that's pretty much what we're spending now, eight hundred million, something like billion. Uh, yeah, we could definitely find ways to. I don't think the answer is paying teachers more, but fix up the schools. Uh, but it seems like everything is just going in the opposite direction there, to be honest. Uh, and I, I hate to blame too much these things too much on the liberals, but there, there are some things, Greg, that as, as an American, you know, I mean, I lived there, 
grew up there as a child 40 years ago. And uh, of course, as a child, I couldn't have grown up there any other way. But uh, I see things happening now, like, for example, transgender issues, okay, being mm-hmm. discussed, uh, sexual edu- sex education being talked about in the third grade, um, kids being told that if they if they tell their mom and dad, if they wake up and say, Mommy, Daddy, uh, today I want to be a boy, and then mom and dad, for some bizarre reason, get it into their heads that, okay, we can go along with this, and they start putting Johnny on hormone hormones mm-hmm. to change his whatever. I mean, I'm all for anybody having whatever sexual preference they want, but I, I personally believe that there's a there's a limit, there's a time when we shouldn't be talking to kids about these things. Okay. And it's so it's gotten to the point in the United States now where and this is actually written into medical medical law that if a child, if the parents bring their child to a psychiatrist, okay, because the child is, I don't know, nine years old, okay, eight years old, whatever, and they're, they're saying that for a boy, he's saying, okay, I'm a girl, I believe I'm a girl, I want to wear girls' clothes and everything. The psychologist, the psychiatrist cannot try to challenge that view. Mm-hmm. They have to go along and they have to accept what the child believes and what the child wants at that age. I mean, I I look at my son. My son sometimes wants to push around a baby stroller in the the playground. He gets a kick out of it. He's two and a half years old. Okay? Now, I'm thinking to myself, this is just a natural thing. And you have girls who want to play with trucks. You have boys who want to play with baby strollers once in a while. But for any parent or any system of government or any psychiatrist to say, and I'm saying this to somebody without any sort of medical degree, but to be to say that I'm going to accept this child's opinion and then go along with it, dress this child up in, in girls' clothes or the vice versa. I'm going to tell that school that 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 my son's teacher to start addressing him with a girl's name in school. Okay? I don't understand how that's even possible, how that even is even remotely sane. And for me. I do not want to send my child into something like that. And this is not something that's just, I'm mm-hmm. totally okay. Like I said, mm-hmm. Greg, I'm totally okay with transgender. You want to be transgender? Go ahead. Be f- it's fine. Do whatever you want. Wait till you're 18. And especially, <laughs> especially don't talk to my, don't talk to my, I don't want, I don't want, I'm paying, I'm paying. If I was in the United States living there and paying taxes, I'm paying taxes to my locality to educate my child. I'm not paying them. To, to support some kind of ideology. I mean, they've got to the point now where they have cross-dressing, li- uh, what is it called? They bring kids into a library and they have guys dressed up like women reading stories to children. And the stories are, of course, not your typical uh, thing. So maybe for some people, this is, this is okay. But this is where the divide, you're talking about, about polarization. This is really where in the United States, there are some people, they're like, and then under Barack Obama, he wanted to have, um, he not only wanted to have, he passed a law that said, if a guy or woman wakes up, decides that day that they are the opposite sex, they have the right to use the bathroom of their choice. Me as a guy, I can walk into a restaurant and who knows where, Texas, somewhere along the highway, and I can say, today, I identify as a woman. I'm going to use that toilet, and I don't care who's in there, because it's me, it's my, I'm, I'm, and it, it has nothing to do anymore with biology. Biology has flown out the window. There is no more biology. It's all about how I feel, what mm-hmm. I feel like, my emotions, my self-identity. It has nothing to do with XX or XY chromosomes. No more. This has been, it's no more about that, and personally... I mean, I know that, and it's a highly explosive issue. You get on Twitter, you could, and I've seen, I've seen, this is another thing that's very disturbing. I've seen accounts of people on Twitter, they've, they have the same opinion as me, gone, gone. And they don't say anything radical, nothing radical. They just question it and they're gone. Twitter bans them, you know, so... You know, so what do you do? What do you do in a situation like that? Uh, I don't know. 
I don't know. And it's to me, it's it's extremely dangerous. If the liberals get into power again, it's all going to come back again. Men will be able to use the women's toy. I mean, biologically born men born. You have to be very careful how you how you say these things. Transgender men. Okay. So, anyways, it's it's all about names and tags and everything. So, I see if 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 the liberals would happen to get into power in November. It's all going to be rolled back again, and you're going to see this. And so that just increases the polarization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly does. Although I don't agree with uh, much of what you said, I strongly believe that it's not not good that social platforms uh, ban people for expressing similar views, mm -hmm. uh, concerns, saying what they feel, what they are uh, apprehensive about. Uh, although I would uh, argue about, like, wait until you are 18 uh, uh, to become trans transgender. I'm not a medical expert, but I think that kids uh, understand their gender much earlier than 18. Although, yes, of course, if your kid is two, two and a half years old, okay. it's certainly too, too early. I, I, I would agree with that. Okay, um, I just want to, I don't want to continue on that point too much longer, but if you, if you look at the, what is actually happening to these kids who go through the process, um, it's, it's actually, it's horrifying because a lot of them now, they've gone through operations, they've had body parts removed, they've had uh, hormones injected into them, puberty blockers, where their puberty literally stops, okay? At a very young age, 12, 13, 14, okay? Um, and I see what you're saying, but uh, the fact is right now, there are so many kids who get older, they mature, and they understand, heck, I made a mistake. And Are there that's any the statistics of, on how many such people? I have no are? idea, but I know that it's it's a problem. So there have it's been something cases like really, that. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's, but it's I don't think serious. that's many. Why do you think so? Well, uh, just a guess. I'll have to check, of course. Yeah, too, because it's actually it's quite a, it's quite a serious problem. I mean, even the mainstream media is starting to talk about it. That these kids they have the transgender operations, and then later on in life, I mean, just like you know, any kid. When I was fifteen, I wanted to be a, a fireman. Okay. <laughs> well, that's the difference. <laughs> okay, but yeah, but you're you know we're talking about mentality here, and your your views change over time, and to actually allow a child to to have some sort of an operation, chemicals, and these chemicals are not just temporary, they're, they're for the rest of their life. These hormone blockers, mm -hmm. it goes on forever. So you, once you sign up to this, it's, it's lifetime. And yeah, but it's those therapies quite... are like lifesavers for many people who feel that they are trapped in a, a body of a different, uh, a different sex and... Mm -hmm. uh, they now, due to all those therapies, can can be themselves and be happy. Yeah, I agree with you, Greg. I think I, I absolutely agree, and I, I think that people should have that right. I just think that there should be a legal age when they're able to make those decisions, and I don't think that mm -hmm. they should be talked... I don't think the school system should be talking to them about it. I see your point. Um, and the media, we started with the media, we started with social media, uh, is inclined more to 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 pol polarize people even more uh, on this issue, on similar issues, left wing, right wing. Uh, do you think it uh, that that the media will polarize uh, uh, the American people more, or that uh, there will be some ways to fix it media wise? Uh, I think I think it's in the interest, especially right now with Trump. In office, uh, we're in a, we're in a period of time in the United States that's unlike many other periods of time. Um, this president, he's I can't I can't think of another president that is more hated and despised mm -hmm. in American history than Donald Trump. Um, so, and this is my opinion, but it seems and I don't know if you can even say it's an opinion. It looks to me like it's pretty much fact that the entire 99% of the of the media industry is against Trump. I mean, you could you could just conduct a yeah. simple experiment, go on to CNN, go on to any any mainstream media in the United States, MSNBC, Drudge Drudge Report has just become unbelievable. It used to be conservative. It's just 
you go on there now, I, I can't even read it anymore. It's, it's like CNN. It's unbelievable. So even Fox News, it's starting to, it's starting to shift. Um, so this polarization right now and this, uh, this desire to split American society, it's, it's, right now it's, it's at a horrible uh, state because, in my opinion, what they want to do and that's has that's going to this, this whole wide thing with the COVID. They wanted to shut down the economy, um, and the liberal states um, took really, really harsh measures against their people, much more so than the Republican states. Now, when I look at that, I see that okay, and I could be reading it wrong, but I see liberal governors want to, wanting to create a situation in the United States where they crash the economy. They've made the people so angry. They've taken away the ability to go in the ocean, sit on the beach, go out onto a boat, onto an empty lake, cut your grass. I mean, it's just, this is, uh, to me, it's really, it's unbelievable. Some of the, the, the legislation that, and measures that are being passed in order to protect ourselves from Lord knows what. And um, so in that regards, yeah, I think the media, and the media is backing this up. The media supports it. They never, they very rarely question when these liberal this when this liberal legislation is passed they just go along with it they don't question it there's no the whole idea of of um hardball journalism in the united states has really just died it just doesn't exist it's all everybody's on the same page as far as the liberal left ideology goes i mean there's a 10 percent alt-right call it what you want mm -hmm. conspiracy theorists yeah, yeah okay but for the most part it's really um really Left wing and uh, divisive. Divisive, I'd have to say. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyone who wants to read an outside view on uh, how things are going in America, although this book was written several years ago, but I think yeah. uh, uh, it, it your your views on this topic have have not uh, significantly changed. So check out Robert's book. The link will be in the description of the video and of this podcast. Um, Robert, thank you so much for coming. Let's hope that this polarization will will get better with time and that, that we'll all overcome uh, all these issues and uh, live happily and not in, uh, uh, in constant wars and fighting with each other. Absolutely. I agree. Thanks for inviting me on your show, Greg. It's, it's been a pleasure. I'm Greg Mastreader. Subscribe to me on YouTube, on uh, iTunes, Spotify, and other podcasting platforms. Hit the like and subscribe button if you liked this video. See you next week. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Woo!